Well, good evening, legend, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, very special event. Uh, you're here, of course, because our guest is George Papandreou. Uh, George Papandreou has had uh, a very notable career. Uh, he's been Minister of Education, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he was Prime Minister of Greece between 2009 and 2011 at the start of the Greek crisis. So our conversation this evening is going to start with uh, George's career and his uh, period as Prime Minister, and I'm going to invite him to reflect on his uh, period in office as uh, head of the government at the beginning of the crisis, and also to reflect now with the passage of time on the evolution of the Greek debt crisis. But George is also president of the Socialist International, and so it seems to be the opportunity for us to connect perhaps his responses to the Greek crisis with the wider agenda of the challenges, the future for social democracy, for the left uh, in Europe, uh, internationally. So we should have a fairly expansive uh, conversation, but we will finish so there is plenty of time for your contributions, comments and questions uh, from the audience. We like to think that rather more important than being merely Minister of Defence, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Prime Minister, more important than that is that George is an, alum an alumnus of the London School of Economics. He gained a Masters in, can I say, 1977 uh, in sociology here at the school. And in fact, uh, George has been a very good friend of his alma mater. I'm particularly grateful that as Minister of Education, he encouraged the creation of the chair that I now hold, the Venezuela's chair on contemporary Greek uh, studies, and therefore the creation of our research unit here at the school, the Hellenic Observatory studying Greece and Cyprus. And there are a number of other ways where privately George has uh, been very helpful uh, to the LSE. So we're very grateful for him returning because George has spoken at the LSE quite a few times and uh, I think this is a fairly average size audience for when George Papandreou speaks at the school. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll have a conversation. We'll open it up to you uh, for questions and uh, comments. Uh, you can follow um, and make your comments on Twitter as we go along. There is a hashtag behind me. Uh, there is not a hashtag behind me. <laughs> but uh, what you're looking for there is the hashtag. <laughs> I've become a weather forecaster. In the, in the Northwest, you can see the hashtag. Uh, the hashtag uh, LSE uh, Greece. You can make your comments as we uh, proceed. But we are going to proceed. Let's uh, get down to it. And can you please join me in giving a very warm welcome back to the London School of Economics for George Papandreou. Perhaps I could just start with um, a more personal question, George, if I can. Firstly, let me also welcome you uh, personally uh, here. Um, perhaps to an international audience, a question which might uh, arise is that George Papandreou is the third prime minister in his family. Was it inevitable that you would pursue a political career? Was it predestined? Uh, well, thank you, Kevin, again, and uh, it's great to be here again at the LSE, and certainly at the time when uh, many issues, I think, uh, even though Greece is a particular case, one can uh, hopefully deduce a number of uh, very important uh, conclusions about what's happening in Europe, the UK with Brexit, and of course around the world with uh, globalization and, uh, and the global capitalism. But um, yes, I, I, I wasn't planning to get into politics in, in the official way, uh, even though many people would say, why don't you get into politics when I was a kid? And uh, mm. because of my, both my father and my grandfather were, 
one way or another involved, uh, I, uh, I sort of rejected, I said, why should I be also in politics? Uh, I think what happened was that my, my life, the life that not only I went through, but our generation, my generation went through was highly political. Uh, I lived through a dictatorship. I saw my grandfather and father in jail because of that exile in Sweden, Canada, and here in the UK. Famously, uh, you saw your father arrested. Yes, I, was, uh, I had a gun pointed to my head when I was 14 years old to, to reveal his hideout, but he actually heard that and came out and gave himself up, so it was quite a dramatic moment. But other than that, that was not just my experience, the experience of quite a few Greeks um, uh, during the dictatorship. Uh, the torture, the, um, then of course the student, the movements, uh, anti-Vietnam in the US, uh, the movements for black power, ethnic power, gay movement, uh, environmental movement, women's movement. These were all very uh, nascent movements at the time, but very powerful. And so when uh, I got back to Greece uh, after the exile, of course I got involved more as an activist in, in, in politics. Um, I worked a lot on education, on civic education, sort of how, yes. how is a democracy working and so on. And then finally in 1981, um, I decided that um, I was given this offer, but there was a sense that things could actually change. So that's when I decided to, to go into politics. But until then I was saying, no, 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 not politics. I'd rather just go to a Greek island, play my guitar and in, enjoy I can see the attraction of a Greek island playing a guitar. Um, I wonder if we could fast forward then to 2009. You become uh, prime minister. You're leading PASOK in a notable uh, electoral uh, victory. Um, perhaps it would be useful for you to identify what your expectations, aspirations were for government. What I'm getting at is that uh, as you entered government, you appeared to wish to make a conscious break with previous PASOK governments, the government of Kostas Simitis, for example, you had a new set of personnel for your, for your government. This was a new image, new face uh, for PASOK. How would you identify uh, your party coming to power in 2009 in relation perhaps to a wider European uh, left, but also with the predecessors, the, uh, the government of Kostas Simitis, for example? We had uh, our basic slogan is either we change or we sink. Yes. It actually rhymes in Greece. Yalazhme vuyazhme, we would say in Greece. But um, we really had a sense that there were needed deep structural reforms, which, uh, uh, although they had been, there had been quite a few changes in Greece over the years after the dictatorship, the, there were some areas which really remained... Uh, Sort of, sort of, I would say, as, as, as established um, practices that had to change, practices and, and structures that had to change. Uh, so even though during the Pasok era where we had, we developed a number of things, right? We would have you know, the, the health system, the pension system, uh, the, the welfare system in general, but also some decentralization and so on. Still, Greece was very uh, top-down, centralized, mm. very highly bureaucratic, and um, still politics highly clientelistic. I usually try to describe the Greek economy as a, as a clientelistic capitalism, not crony capitalism, but ca clientelistic capitalism, where uh, sort of the spoils of, of, of the government uh, are given to certain groups or certain individuals, uh, and that basically was a way that we, wasting the real resources and the capacities, and of course, deeply unmeritocratic as far as, you know, utilizing the great capacity that Greeks do have. And, you know, just thinking about the Greeks that are living in, in the UK or studying or, or working here, there is a huge capacity in, in, in the Greek population, whether in Greece or outside Greece and the diaspora. So, that, so my idea was let's make deep reforms in the political system and in the governance system, because that was actually what had uh, created the problem we were, were facing. We didn't realize, of course, the depth of the problem at the, at the moment of the, the deficit and the debt 
and the, the reaction of the markets to what Greece was uh, going to be revealing, what I had yeah. to be revealing as yeah. to the actual situation, yes. of course. But you appeared to make a conscious decision to uh, not simply follow the modernization project of Costa Simitis. George Papandreou's government would be different from that. And I wonder how you would explain that difference, how you would uh, characterize the difference between what you hope to achieve in government and what uh, the Simitis Pesot government had achieved. Well, obviously, the Simitis government had achieved quite a few things. We had, um, I would say, one was the infrastructure, uh, huge infrastructure projects, and that's changed Greece quite, quite, quite a lot. Of course, coming into the euro, uh, some would say we came into the euro er too early, but still, that was an achievement. Um, the the um, uh, on in foreign policy, which I worked a lot, we had uh, uh, were able to uh, reshape the relations with with Turkey, Turkey uh, bring Cyprus into the European Union. Uh, and uh, play an important role in Europe, the sort of European prospects for the Balkans and Western Balkans in particular, but also all of the Balkans. So these were these were important um, important elements, but none of these dealt with the core problems of the Greek state, which I think is um, unluckily something which goes back even to the beginning of the Greek state in Indeed. 1830. Indeed. And, uh, and with, there have been repeated attempts for modernizing or changing this. And, uh, and obviously this has gone up against um, very strong resistance uh, in, in, in embedded interests. Uh, so I said this is what we need to, to do. Uh, and uh, particularly since we're in the Euro and in Europe and uh, uh, we need to, to become a much more um, open, transparent, modern state. That was, I think, one of the things, which, which is to try to break the ties with this clientelism. Now, that, that clientelism developed more on the right, of course, the right-wing uh, policy, but as Paso slowly kept in government for, for a long period of time, it was slowly subsumed into this practice also, even though we made changes for ASEP, is with this special yes. way of, of, of choosing people for, for the public sector, which was meritocratic and not, and not through, um, uh, you know, just uh, clientelistic, I get patron clients yes. relations. And, but this, uh, this was going against the grain, of course, and, uh, but that was the slogan, that was the, what we were promising, and that's what people voted for. Uh, I would add to that, that if we talk about the European left, I, our program is very much a green program, so we were saying we wanna be in the forefront of, of bringing, linking both the social, Democrat, social democracy with the green agenda, we wanted to become, as we call, the Denmark of the South, so opening up to, to green and renewable energy, the whole uh, sustainability program. Uh, we also wanted to be much more decentralized, decentralizing governance, much more deliberative, so bringing in forms of uh, participation, uh, popular participation, citizen participation in deliberation, which I think was um, a somewhat um, quite different than the sort of traditional social democratic <coughs> procedures, which were a bit more uh, party-based and, and more hierarchical. We were much more in this tradition of, of bringing in grassroots movements, opening up to different movements and so on. So that's, uh, and of course we, we in Greece, uh, and this is not just our party, but many, many of the parties in Greece have been much more pro-European. Um, but a European, of course, seeing Europe with, with the changes that are needed, of course, and I think there are quite a few changes that are needed, but uh, we wanted to see a deepening of integration and, and a strengthening of, of the European yes. um, presence in the world. On the economic front, of course, you came to power after the onset of the international financial crisis. A year before, there'd been the collapse of Lehman Brothers in the United States, and uh, perhaps uh, part of the support for your government was uh, indeed motivated by hope in the context of an international financial crisis. There's another way, etc. Now, famously, of course, you use the phrase, lefta ipahun, there is, uh, there is money. Money exists, yes. Money exists, there is money. Resources exist, yes. Now, uh, if I remember correctly in the speech, uh, that was a very qualified um, reference, but it became associated with you that uh, 
Prasad uh, comes to power, we're going to have a reflation of the economy that is money. Um, very soon, you would be told that actually uh, the economic situation is much more difficult. And I wonder at what point you realize that uh, this was a kind of mamma mia moment, as it were, that uh, the economics were going to be much, much uh, tougher. I understand that uh, others, like the then uh, central bank governor, Yorgos Provopoulos, for the Bank of Greece, uh, would say that he was telling each of the party leaders uh, at the point of the election in 2009 that there's a deficit problem and it's not looking good. I wonder which point you realize that actually uh, the economy and the government deficit was going to be a major constraint for you. First of all, on the money exists, it was a, it was a very qualified what I said. And then, of course, what happened was that um, the, at some point the opposition just used, cut that phrase, yeah, yeah. and did not re read, uh, would not talk about the other things that I said as I said that. And in all my statements I said, of course we have resources if we do this, this, and this. And what I said, if we fight tax evasion, if we fight corruption, if we fight waste, if we cut red tape so we can bring in uh, investment, then uh, these are the types of things, if we merge a lot of the um, uh, government agencies which were overly populated and so on. So I was saying these are the things we have to do. Anyway. Anyway, and these will give us resources. And actually, I still believe it, and I, I would say it again, because we did prove that. I mean, for example, when we cut corruption in, in the, by, by posting every um, possible uh, um, uh, the, um, disbursement, dis, dis, disbursement and decisions, uh, financial decisions of the government and from the local to the central government online with a small, very quick and simple law which said nothing is legal, no expenditure is legal if it is not posted on the web. Uh, that immediately cut out a lot of waste and even some corruption, uh, so people could not, because people could see and people could, could so, they, they, so the, the government was accountable to the view of the, each citizen, journalist, the public, uh, or for example with the uh, e-prescriptions where we put in yes. a, uh, a very simple software program where doctors had, who were contracted with the government had to use the computer uh, program to uh, prescribe medicine. Because what was happening is they were over-prescribing, uh, they were getting kickbacks from the multinationals, the multinationals were making a lot of money, some of the doctors were making a lot of money, and people were being very unhealthy because Greece is now number one of the two countries, the number two country uh, in, in, in Europe that has um, diseases from the overuse of antibiotics and we have a lot of uh, uh, deaths in hospitals because of this. Uh, and, and of course it was very unhealthy for the pension system too, or our, our social welfare system because it cost a lot. Well, just through this one measure we cut the cost by 3 billion euros. Now 3 billion euros is as much as we get in property taxes in Greece every year. So what I was saying is this is where the money is. If we have good governance, if we have transparent governance, if we have meritocratic governance, if we, have, if we use electronic governance, e-governance, uh, for making things quicker, simpler, less bureaucratic, yes, we will have resources. We will do this. Now, so the core of my program was actually didn't change. As a matter of fact, we had to push even more because we were seeing that if we didn't do these reforms, we would have to cut wages more, we would have to cut pensions more. Let's, for example, in this e-prescription, if we had to find another three billion that we didn't find from, that, from there, we would have yes. to cut more, more from, our, from uh, the other program. And I didn't, I didn't, I was, I think, one of the uh, candidates that, uh, that uh, had promised the least as far as uh, economic or financial benefits. We did have, um, we did say we were going to give one billion to one billion extra to education. We didn't do that. Finally, of course, that had to change. We said we would bring in nurses because we had too many doctors and too few nurses, and that was actually counterproductive. We did that because that actually meant meant the hospitals would be working more efficiently. 
we were going to give uh, a, a stipend to the poor. Uh, we actually raised tax in 2009 and raised one billion of tax from taxes from the richer parts of society and, 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 and corporations. But we only spent half of that because we realized that we had to um, deal with the, the deficit crisis. And I so, wonder, so, uh, so, sorry, so, what, so I, what I would say is the core of the program remained. remained. But what happened was that the deficit crisis and the sovereign debt crisis, uh, of course, took all the attention uh, and became the priority, unluckily, for um, all our ministers and the government because we were going otherwise bankrupt. When you um, look back at 2009 and the, the causes of the, the crisis in Greece, uh, clearly some of the causes were uh, deep and long term. Some of the causes uh, were uh, much shorter term actions that the previous government had, had taken. Uh, speaking to partly a, a overseas uh, audience, how would you very briefly identify the causes of the Greek crisis? Well, three areas. First of all, the global financial crisis. So there was the there was Lehman Brother, there was the the the, the uh, financial fraud actually that uh, oh, many of the banks were selling these bonds yeah. as AAA and they were they were junk bonds and people were buying them and, and other banks were buying them and other uh, investors were buying them uh, so that created a fear in the markets uh, sort of like um, any kind of a rattlesnake you know creating a, a stampede. Uh, was the sort of psychology that I, that I, I felt when we were in power in, in Greece in, in the early 2009, 2010, 2011. Uh, and so that was the one cause. The second was the architecture of the European Union euro, where um, it hadn't been realized that, uh, you know, some countries have different competitiveness, uh, different... Um, governance structures uh, where we were being lent money at the same rate or a lot of money being lent to Greece without due diligence as where this money was going to. Uh, and uh, unluckily went to a lot of, um, again, clientelistic types of activities rather than really productive uh, activities where Greece could actually become more competitive in many areas. And uh, so I, I can get into that, but this, I don't want to get into details of the architecture of the euro. Yep. Uh, and the third, of course, was Greece itself. And what, that's where we had problems. What were the Greek factors? That well, the Greek factors were some of the underlying problems which we did have, as I said, of um, not using resources. So a lot of resources were, were coming into Greece, but they were not used in a productive way. So we were accruing debt, but not developing productive capacity okay. and competitive capacity. And so that was one of the... And, and that's, that, that was had a that been a long-term issue or just the that, previous government? That was, that was, I would say that was um, the, 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 the problem of the state was a long-term issue. But the government, the governance, the five years of the Karamanis governance doubled the debt and didn't really do much, much anything productive. So, uh, so we had that problem. But the worst of the problems, which I diagnosed later was that um, even though Provopoulos may have come to us the last moment saying, you know, there are there is this possibility that, you know, we may have a high budget uh, de deficit, uh, we had no official um, information from the government, even though I had asked for it. And that just shows another structural yes. institutional problem. Yes. Can you imagine a government not telling you the truth about the budget, not telling, not the opposition, but the Greek people, what the budget is, hiding that, and not only that, but then sending false information as to what the budget deficit was three days before the elections. Now, what that meant, what that meant was that when we got into government, there was a huge, not only deficit um, gap or a debt gap or a competitive gap, but there was a huge credibility gap. Mm. People could not believe that this happened and then could not believe our statistics. And that created even more havoc in the market. 
let me reassure you that uh, in the UK, in the context of Brexit, we can fully understand governments uh, <laughs> giving information which may be contestable. Uh, we're used to that. Uh, okay, let's now then talk about the uh, progress of the, the crisis. May 2010, there's a, a bailout. Uh, and you're uh, speaking to the Greek public and talking about the, uh, the necessity of, of this bailout. On reflection, why wasn't the first bailout enough? The first bailout, I would say... Um Possibly we could even have avoided the bailout. Had, and this is where I'll be critical of, of the European Union, the, when, the Europe, when Europe, our partners in Europe, looked and saw the problem in Greece, they initially said, oh, this is a Greek problem. Yes. So the whole burden was on Greece to change. But that wasn't true. The markets were very jittery. Uh, the markets were wondering is Europe going to support Greece, not just its reform program, but support its bonds? It's, is it, well, you know, it's, is it, are, are we going to go out and say, you know, don't worry, market, Greece is doing its job and we're going to support Greece. Uh, as was done actually two years later by Mario Draghi, who said yes. at some point, we, these markets, because they, they were not hitting Greece then, they were hitting Greece also, but they were hitting Italy and Spain, and, and even France and Belgium, so there were countries that were really being under pressure from the markets, that they, they saw their spreads or the interests on their bonds going up to a point which they would most likely need to be bailed out also. So what Mario Draghi did is he said, listen, these markets are speculating. I am going to tell the markets, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to stop the markets, to mitigate the markets, this force, and stop the speculation. And I'll even buy the bonds of Italy and the bonds of Spain at, at a price which will undercut the speculation in the markets. Now, if that had been said for Greece when we were doing our reform program, we may not have needed to ask for money. And actually, I, I went to Merkel and I said, I don't want your money. I don't want to come for money. I want your support in the markets so that I can continue my reform program. And, of course, Merkel was saying, don't worry, the markets will understand. And I said, I'm not sure the markets will understand. There's, uh, and, and they were actually overreacting, and even the rating agencies, after they had been uh, you know, uh, compl complicit in rating these AAA bonds, now they were finding, they were, wanted to show their, aus their austere nature and by hitting Greece, so say Greece would, you know, so they were, we were really having problems. Um, we didn't have the support then. So I think that was one of the issues. Uh, the, the, the second point was um, Europe was doing too little too late, so the, the markets were not being... And, the, and then the, and the program, they were asking from Greece too much and too quick. Right. So they, were, they were asking the, for the that. The Troika. Yes. Very, very... I mean, we, we had the record. Uh, at those time, we were records in the OECD uh, of of cutting the budget more than any other country in the world, and yet in the OECD, yep. that is. Uh, so we, had the, we were number one, and we were number one in reforms compared to any other country after the, 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 right. the, the financial crisis. So we were doing more than anybody else. Now, now, the whole issue was that these reforms and this adjustment program was to take us out into the markets. But after a while, people saw, that, and, and Dominique Strauss-Kahn in this famous trip that he never made to meet Merkel from New York was actually going to go and tell Merkel, listen, this program uh, is not, this is not just a Greek issue we have to figure out because Greece will not be able to access the markets in 2012. That was the point when we were going to go out and access the markets from this adjustment program. But the reason was not because of Greece. It was because the wider euro was doing, not doing well. Right. When we think of that first bailout, some, of course, argue that it had the wrong priorities um, it was too tough uh, at the time. I wonder um, what you've just said uh, suggests that it was a content and prioritization which was given to Greece rather than Greece volunteering this particular uh, set of priorities. Uh, on, re on reflection, do you feel that the, 
the priority actions were uh, perhaps the, the wrong ones? Other things could have been done better? Well, I had always said, even from the beginning, but you know, you're in a, we're in a difficult, difficult negotiating position when you, you have two, two choices between bankruptcy uh, and leaving the euro and maybe following a program which is then uh, uh, dictated in some way or another by your, by your uh, lenders. Um, of course, we negotiated. But, uh, and the first, I would say, there, there were three memoranda. Yeah. You should read them all. I would, I would suggest everybody should read them all. The first one, I think, was the most um, um, uh, uh, lenient, if you like. But it, again, it had the problem that it was putting too much emphasis on quick fiscal consolidation, that is, cutting the budget deficit very quickly, rather than looking at the deeper reforms Greece needed. And I felt that the, my part, the partners in the European Union didn't really understand the Greek problem that well. Mm. And uh, their dogma, of course, and many of them conservative, and also the ECB, was, you know, austerity is good, the markets will, that will bring, things, bring things, you know, into, uh, into balance, uh, and uh, so the formula was always, if things didn't go well, more austerity. If things don't go well, even more austerity. Yeah. And that was the wrong formula. And one gets the sense and I, that... And I would add please. to that, there was one other point, which I think here in the UK you can understand quite well, the uncertainty. So Britain is now going through this period of uncertainty, what's going to happen with Brexit, you know, where is the, and that is hitting the economy. That's hitting people's lives. Uh, companies don't know what they're going to stay or leave, uh, invest or not invest. Well, we had a very similar situation, but that wasn't to our that wasn't our choice. But it was a rumor, and a very strong rumor, that Greece may leave the euro. So what will happen? What happened is that during those two years when um, we were in the initial stages of the first program, and you know we where we would have had growth, where people were interested in investing, when they heard that Greece would possibly leave the euro, then they would say, okay, I'm not gonna invest. I'm not gonna borrow, I the banks wouldn't lend. Um, I'm not gonna consume. I'm gonna take my money out of the country or yeah. put it under a pillow, under the mattress, or uh, foreign direct investment. We had the Qataris, they were gonna invest 15 billion in the Elinico, which is the old airport. Yes. When they heard about Brexit, they said, actually, Let's wait and see. Maybe we'll invest when you have drachmas. And at that time... So that's a that paucity of economic you. development. Yeah. That really undercut the program also. Thanks. At that time in 2010, you never gave serious consideration to Greece exiting the euro. Actually, we did. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad um, that actually Tsipras now has recognized this publicly that um, because he said in a recent um, speech he made in um, Berlin at the SPD, the Social Democratic Party, he said, well, you know, I thought in 2015 that uh, I thought after the referendum that uh, maybe we, you know, if, if we leave the euro, it would actually hurt the social classes we represent, that is the poor and the middle class and, uh, and more than staying in the euro. Well, that was the dilemma we had in 2010, and we actually made that decision. I remember we had a board, a whiteboard, and I had my uh, ministers and advisors there, and I said, okay, these are three or four scenarios. One of them is going bank go bankrupt. You know, we say we don't pay. And um, the other one is leave the euro, or maybe do both, bankrupt and leave the euro. Uh, and um, the third one would be follow a, an adjustment program and stay in the euro. So we actually looked at what these results would be if we chose one or the other. And we came to the conclusion that uh, it would be better to stay in the euro, something okay. that after many years, uh, even this prime minister who was uh, otherwise thought differently and, and was very vociferously uh, um, opposing what we were doing now has come around and to say that. So that, even though there were difficult sacrifices, um, people decide, we, we, thought, we thought that this would be best. Now, uh, some people say, well, this, was a, this is now eight 
years, eight and a half years of, of trials and tribulations, we didn't expect that this would last so long. No, no. And, uh, and there were many reasons why it did, and there were other, other reasons too. I mean, we had um, different from Portugal and Ireland and Cyprus, uh, an opposition that was not at all helping. From yes. all, we were, we had, we were nobody yes. that was in I was going supporting. to ask precisely about that, that uh, students here write essays comparing bailouts in different countries and the, uh, as it were, the lack of ownership in Greece of a bailout agenda, reform agenda, and contrast that with other countries, as you say, uh, Portugal. Um, I know that later on you considered a referendum, but in the context of spring 2020, when the main opposition party is saying that uh, Greece should not accept the terms of the bailout. Wouldn't there, be, wouldn't there have been a political advantage for you to have had a referendum at that point? Are we in or are we out? And that could have defined the rest of the agenda and um, uh, placed the opposition in a more compliant position. Well, that was my thinking, So, actually. Okay. And that's why I called for a referendum and uh, I said, let Greek people decide and own our decision which way we wanted. Now, the, the referendum would not have been in or out. The referendum would have been, we have this second program, which was um, actually a huge haircut of over 100 billion, the biggest ever haircut in recent history, not for Greece, but around the world. Uh, we had, uh, of course, also further adjustment, which would have been uh, Obviously, it's painful. But sorry, sorry, what I meant was that uh, we know that you were um, talking about a referendum in autumn 2011, but why not have a referendum in spring 2010? And Donis Samaras and yes. New Democracy are, um, I'm sure many of your supporters saw the reaction as being opportunistic. Uh, wouldn't there have been a political advantage in spring 2020 saying let the people decide? Are we in? Are we out? Are we accepting this bailout? Spring 2010. Tw spring 2010. Okay, that's why I, I'm sorry. I got a little bit confused. Yeah, the, um, th there, are, there were a number of reasons. Uh, one was more technical. The other ones were more political. We had just received a mandate, uh, a quite a resounding mandate. So it was 45% and, and, and we had a majority in... in uh, in the parliament, and we tried. I tried to get Andoni Samaras to uh, vote with me in that. Um, but we were also, and this I think has to be quite. We have to understand this, and this is important not only for Greece, but it's important for, uh, I think, our democracies. Unluckily, because the markets are so powerful, they see any. They were looking for any uh, inkling of um, possible uh, destabilization or not following the accorded course. And so- It's been too risky. So it, was, so it would be risky that we would actually precipitate okay. a, a, a possible bankruptcy. So secondly, we had very little time because when we decided to go for the bailout, we actually had we, 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 it took a certain procedure, and it was quite a long procedure. We had about 24 hours before we would go bankrupt in the end. Uh, so we didn't really have much time to think about a referendum. Okay. There's a third technical issue. The constitution in Greece does allow for a referendum, but no government had actually um, made, made, no, made a, a law, because we needed an actual law in the parliament of how you have the referendum. Mm. The constitution says you can have a referendum. But it said, but then you had to have a law that said, oh, how do you have a referendum? Is it consultative or is it decisive? Uh, what is the percentage, for example, that will be, um, make it valid? Uh, how do you organize the different sides? That needed a law, and that took time, which we actually did create uh, in 2011. Okay. And we did say we may go for a referendum. So that was a technical issue, we okay. did, we, which was also an important. I realize I need to uh, speed up because we promised plenty of time for the audience to ask questions. Uh, but I can't um, miss the opportunity to ask about 2011 and uh, the suggestion of a referendum, which of course was going to be so consequential for your own uh, governments. 
Uh, you were the G20 at Cannes. Uh, didn't go well, particularly, uh, with uh, Angela Merkel and uh, Nicolas Sarkozy. Um, as I understand it, Merkel and others were saying, have a referendum on whether Greece is in or out. And you wanted something different. Uh, why? The um, referendum was uh, something I had actually talked to a number of the leaders, Merkel, Juncker, Barroso, von Rompuy, maybe, I assume most people know these names. Yes. Um, and um, I'd said I may have to go for a referendum. I realized that uh, we, could not, we could not implement a second program without a, a wider consensus in our country. And to get a wider consensus, there would be a number of ways. One would be to have a wider coalition government which I had tried and failed because someone else did not want to do it. Um, they could go, we could have gone to elections, but then we would have had um, a risk that everybody would have you know, proposed that we could, do, we could go to paradise and we didn't need to do anything, which was being said by the, the opposition. So I felt that that was not very fair um, because we would be telling the Greek people something that couldn't happen. And thirdly, put the dilemma to the Greek people themselves and say the dilemma would not be in or out. The dilemma would be we have this program. It is you know, a huge haircut and further adjustment. We need to do further reforms. And if we accept this program, it guarantees that we stay in the euro. So that would be yes or no. Uh, Sarkozy wanted a yes or no on the euro. And yes. I, I disagreed, and many in, the, in that meeting in the Cannes said, this is not the issue. Greece does not want to leave the euro. Greece, the question for the Greeks is, do they want to do this program to stay in the euro or not? Yeah. And, and uh, actually, Merkel was, was on my side, but she didn't express that publicly. I had Merkel come out and said, yes, I agree with the referendum. Bravo to Georgos, who decided on the referendum. Uh, I would not have had the opposition in my party as strong, which basically torpedoed. It, was, it wasn't many that were against the referendum in the party, but enough not to get it through parliament, which then, of course, forced me to, um, to abandon the idea and then look for a coalition, which under pressure, someone else finally agreed upon. And I agreed on that to save the program. OK, uh, uh, I promise to. So that actually, one, what I, one of my regrets is that the referendum never took place. Because yeah. I do believe if had we done the referendum, I think we would have won the referendum. I think the Greek people would have owned that program. We would have gone through that much more quickly. I think by 2012, 2013, we would have been out of the crisis or out of the bailout crisis, uh, bailout part of the adjustment program. Certainly, we would have had other reforms to do, but we would have been out in the markets and in a much better position. Okay. I promised to speed up, but also wanted to ask you about uh, some wider European things as well. Final question on Greece, if I may. Uh, is Greece now fully out of the crisis, or what are the, uh, what are the lingering problems that you th you'd feel uh, would be a uh, priority to tackle? I believe we have... <clears throat> We've lost an opportunity to go to make deeper reforms in Greece uh, during this crisis. Uh, because there was so much uh, opposition, the opposition both on the right and on the left who were saying the whole problem is the memorandum or the adjustment program. Uh, so, and they campaigned on that. And they were elected on that against the memoranda or against the adjustment program. And then when they actually accepted the adjustment program, they only implemented that and not the deeper reforms which we had started implementing. So yes. deep decentralization, um, much more transparency. I think Greece could do you know, e-governance everywhere. We could, we could do um, renewable energy beginning with all our islands and then go on to the mainland. We could, be, uh, we could make um, you know, our universities as as uh, attractive as the UK universities were. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> not so soon. This, this, is, this is giving, this is, this is an, op well, unluckily Brexit yeah. for, for, for Britain may create yeah. problems, but it, uh, I'm sure there'll be others. There, there's a whole, the Greek universities could be opened up and we had a reform there too. 
And a lot of the students uh, are graduates, young people that have left Greece and come out of Greece could actually come back to teach or to be okay. or, or our hospitals. And so there are a lot of reforms we could do. I think that we lost the opportunity to do that. Now we still need to do that. So without doing that, um, we are now in a situation where we have two parties basically vying for power. And you hear they're basically um, proposing things that I would say are somewhat clientelistic again. They're not really deeper reforms, uh, which is not uh, going to bode well for really uh, investment, startups, um, you know, uh, new types of, 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 of um, uh, companies that could actually be more productive and competitive okay. in, in, our, in our country. So an opportunity has been missed. Uh, Greece is uh, required to have uh, an election before um, the end of uh, next year, well before the end of next year. Uh, if you look at the opinion polls, um, the prospect is that no single party would get a majority. Uh, there's then the question of who's going to form a coalition with whom. If it came uh, to a situation in which the, uh, the two main parties, Syriza and New Democracy, were more or less of the same size or not a great difference, uh, in terms of seats in the parliaments after the election. But yourself, your allies on the centre-left have a choice to make. Are we going to support a Syriza co coalition? Are we going to support a new democracy coalition? What would you do? Uh, I think the, our movement that, that uh, the centre-left or the socialist left, social democrats, uh, we, my, pers my opinion is that the question is not, because everybody's pushing this idea that, okay, some, you have to create a coalition because otherwise Greece will not be governed. Uh, now the governability issue is an issue, it was an issue, quite an important issue during the crisis. I don't think Greece has a problem of governability and they don't need, if, if we are a third party, for example, I don't, necessarily need that we, we have to be there. We have to be in power. We so have it can to be, be a minority government. Well, we'll see. But I would say the, the focus should not be on who are you going to be with, but what do we want to change in Greece? Okay, okay. And that is, should be our compass uh, in, our, in our party here. We, we need changes in Greece. That is what we, and we, we, we are putting out a program. We have our ideas. This is where we not. So being in government, that's not the issue. Being a minister again, or for the first time, that's not an issue. You know, enjoying the spoils of, 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 of power, that is, not, that is exactly the wrong way to look at politics. Okay. What are the major changes we need in Greece? Let's fight for them, and I don't care if we're in government or not in government, maybe we can fight for them better outside of government and really push for reform that is okay. necessary. Some of the supporters of Alexis Tsipras have compared him to your father the young, younger Andreas Papandreou. What do you think about the comparison? Well. <laughs> um, many have emulated. Uh, attempted. Attempted to emulate uh, my, my father and even on, from the right and also from the left. Um, the I think there, there are major differences in policies. Um, my father, of course, came into power at a very different time in Greek history and the world, Cold War. We were still under the um, sort of dependency in the US and uh, with the uh, experience of a dictatorship, uh, which was, if not masterminded, at least supported by the CIA and of course the US government and the desire for us to be able to be free from this kind of dependency was, was very strong, but also the need for a welfare system. So there were major changes, and, 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 and I, I think over, as I said, periods of time, as PASOK was in power for many years, uh, we started to be subsumed into this, uh, this sort of statist, clientelistic policy. 
uh, and that was, of course, negative, a negative thing for us. I think um, Syriza was very quickly subsumed into this clientelistic uh, and didn't really come to make any, I would say, progressive reforms. Okay, there were some issues, for example, on, on um, same, same sex marriages, uh, that issue, um, legalization of uh, medical cannabis, okay. But these, were not, these are not the central mm. problems of Greek, the Greek state, and they did not attack, they did not stand up to the interests that really are keeping Greece from being a productive and not a parasitic clientelistic state. Okay. Uh, and so I would say that they, he was, I mean, you can, you can emulate the motions and the type of voice, but that doesn't give you uh, the real oomph to make the changes. I'm reminded of the US presidential debate when a senator from Texas said, um, I knew Jack Kennedy, Jack Kennedy was a friend of mine, you're no Jack Kennedy. Uh, that seems to be what you're saying about the current prime minister. Okay, uh, last couple of points uh, quickly, if I may. Um, some on the left uh, write about the, the future in terms of a different kind of left, a more radical left. Writers like uh, Chantal Mouffe talk about this being a populist moment, uh, moment for the left that the left could more easily achieve power in these circumstances of people feeling socially excluded, uh, problems post-crisis, uh, et cetera, that the left could achieve power across Europe much more easily with a kind of radical populism. Wearing your socialist international president uh, hat and perhaps being sensitive to the Greek uh, context, uh, would you say that that kind of radical populism is a good strategy for the left at the moment? Radical, yes. I wouldn't use the word populism because it has many different connotations and um, uh, there's some negative and positive. Depending on what country, what part of the world you are, uh, populism can be seen in different ways. But there are some real issues. Now, what I see is I see demagogues, mostly on the right, but we do have some on the left too, that will cater to emotions, to fears, uh, will try to find um, enemies, uh, stereotypes, xenophobia, and so on. Uh, but there are some real issues. And these real issues uh, are inequality, the huge concentration of wealth, uh, the environmental climate change problems, the, um, the refugee issue and how we deal with it, um, migration, the population of Africa is going to be is hugely, it's the biggest, the, the most fast growing continent on, in the world right now. Um, and there are issues in technology, of course, too. Mm. We're not only creating, I mean, the internet, we used to be in sort of the, an anarchist dream where everybody would have equal access and we could sort of self-manage our world, uh, now it's, you can see that it could be a big brother. Uh, whether it's a big brother in a government or a big brother in a corporation, but it's a big brother controlling everything we're doing. Then we have robotics and we have um, artificial intelligence, which is now seeping into our lives. Um, Internet of things yeah. and now soon Internet of bodies. So I would say, let me put it this way, um, getting back to the issue of, of, of socialists, we do have to realize that there are huge cleavages in our society and a lot of fear and a lot of marginalized parts of the population. Uh, and even the younger generation, which does feel more, I would say, amenable to a globalized cosmopolitan world, is facing challenges which our generations did not. Yeah. Insecurity, types of work which are flexible but also mean not really permanent and not really sure, um, insecurity, therefore, there also. Uh, we don't know how many jobs will be wiped out, and we don't know, uh, and climate change may be the biggest challenge that any generation in humanity, of humanity has ever dealt with. So I believe we do need um, a more radical approach, because what social democracy uh, has been was basically to 
it was a social contract, mm. of course, between the capitalist the government and the workers. Um, but over time, and particularly in Europe, I would say, it became more of good managers of the capitalist society um, and did not see that, that there was a fallout in society. And we need to bring back um, uh, the sense of citizen empowerment. Yeah. I get and, the and, 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 and that I mean, needs to be changed. And that could be done radic in a radical way. I mean, radical changes need to be done. Yeah. And we have to th rethink democracy to, to revitalize it and to empower people. Uh, but not, I wouldn't call it populism, though. OK. I get the point about the con... I get the... <laughs> <laughs> um, starting a trend, I'm sure, I hope. Uh, I get the point about the content of the program, big issues uh, for Europe and internationally to, uh, to consider. But in terms of winning support for the left, doesn't it help in the context of what you were describing before for Greece to say it's a kleptocracy? They, them, have let you down. Isn't that a fast route to political power? Well, I wouldn't disagree that there's a lot of kleptocracy too. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I would, okay, you were saying that the, this one element of populism, which is we against them. Yeah. Uh, but I think if we look at reality, there are big issues, but we don't have to make it a, let's put it this way, um, an extreme rhetoric uh, creating a cleavage in society which cannot be, cannot be Bridged, but we do have to be quite adamant that, you know, these people that have global wealth, this 1%, if you like, or the 10% that have 90% of global wealth, they aren't going to listen to us if we don't organize. Right. They are not going to be, there, there are some benevolent billionaires and maybe soon trillionaires, but, um, um, and they will be doing their nice programs in Africa and maybe in some other parts of the world. But, um, uh, they are not going to listen to us unless we do have a strong coalition of forces saying there are deep injustices in this world, in this globalized world. Um, the social contract has been basically undermined. Uh, there are big issues which are not being dealt with. Uh, climate change is real and, you know, we don't want money in politics. We don't want these lobbies that are, whether it's corruption or or, or legalized corruption, like the lobbies in the United States, with, where you have Trump saying that, yeah, there's no climate change in California, it's just bad management. Yeah, it's, it's, but it is the petroleum industries that are pushing this. Yes. And so we have to, we have to organize and fight. Um, now, I wouldn't call that populism. I would say this is a re these are real struggles. And these are much better struggles than to, because on these struggles we can actually find compromises where our societies can be better off and our, our, our citizens can be better off. The types of struggles which say you're black or you're white or you're Muslim or you're Christian or you're, I don't know, what that kind of an identity division, there's no solution to that. There's no compromise. Okay. So more of a class struggle we have to get back to. But of course, classes are very different today. But there has to be a much wider coalition of citizens that do feel marginalized and do want to have a voice, do want to be empowered. And that would be a more radical democratization of politics where we give citizens. I would just give you an example. I proposed, and luckily it wasn't accepted or wasn't uh, um, taken, taken as an idea. We have these so-called Spitzenkandidat in Europe. Um, for those who may not know, it's sort of like a, a candidate for the com head of the commission of the European Union. And the different European parties, um, the EPP or the PES or the Greens or whatever, put up a candidate uh, and say, this will be the candidate for our commission, for the commission, if we win uh, yes. a majority or a larger vote yep. uh, in the parliamentary elections, the European parliamentary elections. Well, I said, rather than have this sort of a closed door decision of, um, of our socialists deciding on who the candidate will be, let's open up to a European wide primary where we all, we have a number of candidates and, you know, you know we'll decide, our, our, let the grassroots decide on who they want to be uh, the representative 
for the Commission, our representative as socialists, and then we'll have real debates about, we'll have, and we'll give power to our citizens, we'll give power to our members, to our friends and our citizens to say, we want this kind of policy in Europe as socialists, as social democrats, we want that person who represents, not, not because he's a German or a Slovak or a, or a Dutch, which now they were two, Slovak and a Dutch, but they would actually have the vote. The vote. So I think we need to really think uh, how we um, radically rethink uh, democracy to empower our citizens uh, in, in, this, in this new world. Okay, many thanks. Uh, forgive me for the uh, lax, uh, lap of uh, time, but there's an opportunity now for questions and comments from the audience. Uh, there's colleagues with uh, microphones uh, here. Could we take the gentleman uh, almost at the front here? And, and if possible to have them introduce themselves. Yeah, also. can you just say who you are and then a question, and please bear in mind the time constraints. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, my name is Dimitri Paraskevash. I served as Secretary for Privatization under your father's government, and I was the um, uh, chairman of the Hellenic Alumni Association for some time. Thank you very much for your reflections. Uh, in this room, there are many young, talented people. I read uh, a few weeks ago that the average net pay of a 40 years old person in Greece is 950 euros and that the average employer, 75% of our employers, employ on average 1.3 employees. In this environment, what kind of arguments can you give to young people to go back to Greece and not only you know, give back what they have earned outside Greece, but also get something because there are many people who need money okay. and need a career and also give arguments to people to join politics and try to become prime minister like yourself, rather than a guitar player in an island. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Many thanks. Could we collect a couple of more questions? Sure, uh, whatever, first? However you like. Uh, please, could we take the, the guy right at the very back uh, in the centre, the chap who just put his hand down? Uh, yeah, in the black. Hi, um, my name is Panos Tukalis. I'm a second year undergraduate student at UCL. Um, so my question is the following. I understand, as you said, that uh, once you got into government, the situation was very, very difficult. There was a great uh, budget deficit, a great, a great trade deficit. It was right after the, the global financial crisis. But do you think that you could have pushed for a better program for Greece. Uh, although these were very serious constraints, on the other hand, I if, if my understanding is correct, um, the Gr German, especially German and, and French banks were exposed to Greece at the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. And this could have been a very se serious negotiating um, strategy against okay. uh, to, to push a, f a better and more lenient rather than rather punitive okay. uh, reform pro uh, bailout program for Greece. Thank you. Many thanks. Other questions? Uh, can we take uh, Mary Caldo on the front? I just wondered what do you see as the parallels between the Brexit crisis we're going through in Britain and the Greek crisis? Mm. I think those are big enough questions to uh, pause and invite you to reflect. The, f the first one is how to attract the diaspora back. Yes. Um, may I start from the, okay. from the last to the first? Uh, Greek and, Greek and uh, British responses to, um, to the problems. Well, there is a, a major difference, uh, but it's an interesting parallel. Uh, Britain decided to leave Europe uh, under certain pretexts that uh, there were certain problems. Greece decided to stay in the Euro even though we had huge sacrifices and huge um, issues inside Europe around the way this whole crisis was handled. And I think the conclusion is that Greeks felt that despite the problems Europe has, despite the fact that we can be very critical 
of the way Europe is working today, it is a much better option than leaving. Uh, and that maybe because we're a somewhat smaller country, we realize this even more, that we do have strength in unity. And that when Europe does decide to work in unison, as for example, with Mario Draghi when he said we will do, and it wasn't just him, but the whole Council of the European Union said, we will do whatever it takes. He actually, we, we actually as Europeans calmed the markets and mitigated the problem. <coughs> Europe can do that. When I, I remember just an example, when I was in the presidency of the European Union, then it was quite important, I was foreign minister, and we met with George Bush just after the Iraq war in Washington. The first issue he raised was not the Iraq war. It was, why are you against GMOs? We want to sell gen genetically modified products to Europe. But we had, as a Europe, a common stance. Mm. And that is powerful um, on privacy now, for example, on the issue of privacy on the internet. When we have a common stance, we are powerful. We will affect the world. So I think what we Greeks felt is that being inside the, in Europe and having a voice to influence the decisions was very important. Okay. Um, and and I, would, I would think that um, the UK maybe understands this more as time goes on uh, and that it's no longer this huge superpower that maybe it, it, it had hoped to be. It hoped to We're be, going to through be a government. psychological interesting time. Uh, the second, you want me to... Yes, I, the guy at the back was saying, well... About uh, the, about the negotiation, back. yes. You could push back. One of the problems I hear again and again is we think the negotiation in Europe was only with other Europeans uh, and uh, maybe with just the Germans. The problem was that we were also negotiating with something that you really didn't, couldn't pinpoint, and that was the market, yes. the market um, psychology or the market um, speculators or the market whatever. And uh, had we tried to use a nuclear bomb, let's put it that way, or maybe not a nuclear bomb, but it had threatened to use a nuclear bomb, that we're going to blow up everything um, if you don't, if we don't have a better program. Uh, and as a, as, a, as a tactic, and we couldn't have done this sort of behind closed doors. Nothing in this internet age is behind closed doors. And we would see that any small rumor would immediately hit Greece. I remember just just give you an example. Um, there was a rumor that we were looking for uh, funding from China. Mm. Immediately the spreads went up. Then we said, and you know, Financial Times came out. You know, Greece is looking for money from China and so on. So immediately the cost of borrowing went up. Um, then we went out and we denied it. We said no, we did not ask the Chinese. And then the spreads went up even further. <laughs> so we were dealing daily with this situation where anything could create um, a mass stampede in the markets and Greece could be hurt. So we knew that we didn't have much wiggle room to move. So we did try to negotiate the best that we could. Uh, there was another issue too. Greece at that time, I'm not saying our government, but Greece did not seem credible because previous governments, particularly Karamanis governments, had said in the past, we will take measures, we will do this, we will rein in the deficit and so on. And in the end, not only did they not do that, but they sent wrong numbers, falsified numbers to, to Europe. So we had a very, very skeptical European Union partnership or Euro partners towards us. Now, was, was Europe punitive? Yes, I think there was a punitive uh, thing of, okay, you, you've, you screwed up, you know, you're going to pay for it. Um, I remember talking to many of my American, well, I, I would try to talk to as many people as I could. So, um, former head of the Fed 
Volcker. I call him up once in a while, and he said, well, if in the U.S. we would solve this in two days, then we would deal with the moral hazard or the moral issue. In Europe, you're talking about this punitive, oh, we have to you know, punish the Greeks for what they've done. And this was at a time when we as a government were actually taking measures that had never before been taken. Yes. So this was, this was very negative, and that was a problem. Um, so I, we didn't really have much, uh, much and, 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 and if you want, this is not only my word, but then Samaras came in. He did not have much wiggle room, and you could see that. And then Tsipras came into, and he almost blew the whole thing apart. And you, you saw that there was not much wiggle room. Now, that doesn't mean that we didn't, we shouldn't have tried different things. And I think we could, I think Tsipras could have followed a different tactic, and I had proposed a different tactic. Because uh, I think he could have gotten, after so many years of, of, of adjustment, I think the Europeans were ready to actually be somewhat more lenient. But when you had a, well, here, in, in, here in, 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 in amongst many sort of leftist circles, he's sort of a superhero, Varoufakis. But the damage he did to Greece, adding about a hundred billion more of, 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 of um, cost and debt, uh, was, was huge. Um, but it just showed that we didn't have much room. Now, that is a problem. That is a problem. I'm not saying that's, that, that this, is, this is a good thing. What I'm saying is that if Europe really wanted to, 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 to work together, we could have harnessed the markets and, and made the reform program much more humane and much more uh, palatable. Okay. Um, so then we go to the issue that Mr. Parasquevas mentioned, an important one, and we have a huge brain drain. Um, the question is, can we have a brain gain now from this? This, uh, this is, well, if we don't have, if we don't cut down red tape, where young people can come back and say, do a startup, if we don't um, create the conditions where we're actually helping entrepreneurs, helping new companies, uh, if we don't create a banking system which will actually lend to new, new ventures and not just say, okay, what is your collateral? Because that was the system. Um, if we don't really highlight that we in government will be creating a government that's meritocratic, that is also transparent as much as possible and not just bring in our friends, you know, and see how we control the different ministries or the different agencies. Uh, I think uh, there'll still be many young Greeks that will stay abroad. Uh, and, but I think there are many opportunities, but these need changes. Our education system, uh, we are producing um, unemployment. Okay, a lot of doctors are in Germany, a lot of engineers and, 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 and architects are here in, in the UK and not only, um, but we don't need so many. And one of the reasons why we're producing um, unemployed, unemployed uh, graduates is that we have no link, no real link of our education system with industry and the economy and our society. Uh, if you look and you see where, um, where there's a lot of innovation, those who, I, I go to Boston often, at Harvard, MIT, or Silicon Valley, and you see that new industries are, are growing just next to, are hugely yes. growing next to the universities. I assume that there are similar activities here in, in the UK. Yeah. So we need reform in, in education. Uh, but we also, um, just to give you an idea, we was, I was mentioning this earlier, why not open up our education system to the world? Why are foreign students not coming to Greece? We could teach in English. There is a huge market out there. I go to China, I go to India. Cyprus is doing it. Cyprus has 50,000 foreign students, not only Greek, but from all over the world. Greece could do it too. What a better place to study. But then we would need more teachers. We would need more professors. We would need young people, and then we would bring in, we could bring in, but we'd, that, that would be something that the, we would have to let the universities be more flexible to bring in this young talent uh, to come and teach. 
The okay. same thing in our hospitals. Um, I just wanted to add, there are other areas. Green development. We had a big program called Ilios. It never, it, it never was followed through by the next government. We could be selling um, renewable energy to the world. Food security. We have the Mediterranean diet. We're the number one in fisheries. We could develop that even more. Our tourism could be a wellness uh, tourism. It doesn't have to be simply sun um, and sea. It could be you know, health, wellness, and so on. There are many areas, but this means you have a government that doesn't look just to manage day-to-day -day, you know, small clientelistic politics, but we have uh, a wider consensus for major changes and reforms, which then will allow for young people to come in and I would say, not simply to find a job. I would want this younger generation to shape the future of Greece. And that's why I think they need to get into politics, not in the sense of being professional necessarily, many of them may want to become professionally engaged, but be active, be active. And Facebook is not being active. Facebook is false empowerment. Uh, be really active uh, offline also. Many thanks. Uh, can we take two very quick uh, questions? Uh, could we take the lady on the far right, please? Thank you very much, Professor. Just briefly, if that's okay. Um, say who you are. Okay. Uh, my name is Sana Musharraf. I am originally from Pakistan, and right now uh, I'm an unemployed LSE alumna. <laughs> Let me, say, let me say officially that this is an unknown species. Yes. <laughs> well, it's, it's most likely self-imposed because of some health considerations. Um, but it exists. So um, my question to uh, Mr. Papandreou would be, um, having seen it's periodically uh, countries like Argentina, countries like Pakistan, and um, I've recently heard a podcast on The Economist saying that most likely the next uh, recession or cycle is going to be somewhere in the emerging markets. And these cycles do happen. But from your experience, I've not been able to get a credit card because I'm unemployed. With the structural problems, I'm not blaming Greece, but with the structural problems, what attracts lenders to gamble on economic structures which are still fragile. And as a politician, I think there must be something marvelous in Greece that lenders were willing to bet all that and mm -hmm. infamously then blamed for the Euro crisis. Okay. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, I'm looking for another female, Manam. Um, could we take the gentleman in the center with your hand up in, in black here? Yes, you. Hello. Um, my name is Yanis Manselinas. I'm a medical student at Imperial College. And uh, what I'd like to ask is you've talked to us a lot about today about the crisis and all the reform programs you wanted to bring in, which have been, would have been marvelous if it was actually implemented. But uh, I feel today you've been a bit trying to whitewash history in a sense, because what we did see was a destruction of Greece. Uh, unemployment soaring, public debt soaring, and all the rest. So, yes, it was indeed a great pressure from the market and so on, but do you think that your government did the best they could with the data that they were given? And you're expecting him to say no? <laughs> uh, okay. No, I could, say, I could say what would you Thank do? You. What would you have done differently? Yeah. I mean, that's the question. But what, let's maybe take a third, or did you want to begin with these? Yes, there's a lady in the center uh, here. Could you get a microphone? Yeah, he's coming to your left. Hello. Uh, my name is Evita Suri. I'm working in the Department for Business in the UK A little bit government. closer so I can close the, the microphone. Okay. Uh, so my question is, I would like to draw upon a political term you used, which is the so-called clientelistic capitalism. Uh, 
we know political theory suggests that this type of capitalism is characterized by distinct and rigid policy networks uh, with players that maintain disproportionate level of political clout. Uh, back in 2009, you came with a very progressive program uh, with fresh ideas for structural reforms. Uh, the question here is, how did you plan to change these dynamics of these policy networks in order to allow for an institutional change that would then increase the reform capacity of the state? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we're going to run out of time, so just briefly, if that's okay. okay. Well, the, if you look at the program, the, the many of the issues, beginning from the last question, many of the reforms were to fight against this clientelistic state. It wasn't just clientelistic, it was highly bureaucratic and red tape, and that was part of the, and centralized also, that was part of the clientelism. When you centralize power uh, and uh, you have very, a lot of red tape, you end up citizens asking for favors when they should be rights. So citizens, for the simple rights they have to go to a hospital or to have uh, you know, a permit for their uh, opening up a, a store, those become politicized and, 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 and instrumentalized so that uh, I can get your vote. So I can say, you come to my office, I will help you, and then you vote for me. That was one reason why we have such a centralized Greek state. It was a way to control not only dictatorships, but also through clientelism. So decentralization, we had a major reform with, uh, we had five levels of governance, we went to three with Kalikratis, that's, uh, uh, we cut down on, 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 on quite a bit of the bureaucracy there. Um, we have the peripherias, the regions. There needs more to be done. We need to bring more, um, uh, more power to the, to the regions uh, and, and uh, but we did already make a big step. The transparency, uh, wherever we could do it, um, hitting on clientelistic, this is one way to hit clientelism and, and corruption also, uh, so people can see what's being done. Thirdly, also our, our, our employment policies. Very clear, you can't be employed in the in government st um, um, structures as a permanent uh, employee without going through rigorous exams. Uh, so, and then of course, the, the, um, the way we, 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 we create some independent bodies that will check power, the misuse of power, whether it's in comp competitiveness or whether it's uh, you know, fighting uh, money laundering. We set up a special prosecutor, uh, um, tax, uh, tax evasion, which tax evasion Sometimes we think of tax evasion as you know, from the small shopkeeper, but the biggest tax evasion were huge, quite strong, uh, powerful oligarchs in Greece that were able to get uh, laws through to wipe out um, their taxes. Um, so I would say that these are these are the these are the things that I, I, we we were pushing through. Okay. Um, secondly. I think the problem was that, that we were falling off the cliff, that Greece was, was headed towards destruction um, before, 2000, before I took over, with the, doubling, with the doubling of the debt and the huge deficit. We were falling off the cliff. So what, we, what I was able to do was to be able to soften the fall and, and hold on to Greece so it wouldn't go bankrupt. Had Greece gone bankrupt, we would have much worse destruction. I'm not saying that I'm happy with what happened now because we could have done it better. We, when I say not just Greeks, as Europeans also, we could have dealt with this problem in a much better way and as much, much less painful way. But look at the politics, and that's I think one of the reasons why we've seen this so-called populism on the right. The fact that, for example, the rhetoric around Greece, oh, these lazy Greeks, mm. You know, and that was official statements by politicians in other countries, the lazy Greeks. Well, how would you able, be able to convince your constituency in Germany or in Austria or in Finland or wherever else or in Holland to support 
Greece if you thought they were just lazy Greeks making money and just you know, enjoying their lives. Um, when I looked at the statistics in the OECD, Greeks work more than any other European. We're number one as far as ours are concerned. Now we have other problems, but it wasn't being lazy. So these are, but this kind of rhetoric really undermined, um, I would say, European solidarity and the sense that, uh, and then that, that created, of course, this whole um, uh, sort of fear of Europe and, and so on. It was used here in the UK also in, in, in the Brexit debate. You know, how, how can we be with these other nations that are so different? Um, so I think that this, the, 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 the right was, 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 was um, so in that, in, in that atmosphere, we were able to, to be able to save Greece from, from bankruptcy. When people were saying, I had, I had the Dutch prime minister, he's still prime minister, Rutte, who was saying, oh, why not? Let's have a country go bankrupt. You know, companies go bankrupt, let's have Greece go bankrupt. I mean, he was actually saying that in our meetings. Um, so without understanding the pain it would have taken, because we would not have been able to pay any wages in the public sector, none, no wages, and most likely no pensions. And that would have been for, for a long time. And we would have been kicked out of the euro. We wouldn't be able to pay our debts. What would that mean? Would that mean? Now, if you haven't lived through it, it's very nice to say, OK, you could have done many different things. But you know, this is, these are the difficult political decisions you have to make. I'm proud I made these decisions because I felt, I, and I know I may have made mistakes, but I didn't make mistakes in a way that was purposely on you know, making mistakes. I was, we were fighting. It was like it was a fight every day. Like a forest you know, fire. Uh, it's like it's a forest fire. It's you know you can after the game you can say well you should have thrown the ball this way rather than that way. But that's easy to say. So what we did we were able to save Greece from from major bankruptcy. But I'm unhappy that we could have gone through this maybe in two three years and not eight years and still with other burdens there. Finally, um, I think what you you were mentioning. We have a global capitalist society where th there are um, powers is moved away from many, very much the nation states. I mean, that's why I think we need Europe. We need Europe because we need to be able to humanize globalization. Uh, that's what I think why I would be very much against what the Brexiteers are saying. You're, the, big, the big problems in the world are not going to be solved by more isolationism, by going off to your own corner or to a nice Greek island, but you're always welcome to come to Greek island. But uh, um, problems are global now. Uh, but not only are problems global, but there's huge power has moved from our, our societies to sort of kind of a stratosphere with a lot of wealth, uh, technology, and so on which then is starting to constrain our freedoms. I think we'll see that more and more, and corporations will, will, will do this more and more. Our freedoms will be constrained through technology because we will be followed by these corporations day in, day out, not just governments, but by corporations. They will know, you know if you've you know, jaywalked or if you paid back, you know, you, you, uh, what, what, what kind of, if you're unemployed or if you maybe have a health problem or so on. And they will, they will set the rules as to whether you get a credit card or whether you, get, you can borrow or not. And that's why I think we need to bring back politics because these issues should not be, these new norms, these new laws should not be set by big corporations and, and these major uh, this, 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 this centralized power that, of, of, of wealth that we are seeing around the world. They should be set by our societies. We should decide you know, how we want to deal with these, these new issues and, 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 and how we want to deal with everyday life. So I think, coming back to that, that issue, we need on the one hand more cooperation at the global level and I would say the European level. Europe can be a model of humanizing globalization Europe can, if it wants, push the issue of the Paris Agreement, environmental, um, uh, climate change issues, um, how we deal with refugees. We could deal with it in a much more humane way if we work together. 
and that's why I think Europe is important. But at the same time, we need to give more power to our citizens and allow for them to be much more, uh, to decide much more on, on, on the type of societies we are going to be creating. We have not only a lot of wealth, but we also have this, these new technologies which are, you know, as Yuval Hariri has spoken about, has written about, um, we're becoming little gods. But who, who has the power? Who is controlling this technology? Uh, who will be owning the robots? Who will be, and, and, and who will decide? Who will, who will have the means of production, if you like? And if we don't give this power to our citizens and then as a society decide on what is morally right, what are, and these are, I think, questions that are not technical anymore, not mm. simply policy-driven, but they are deeply moral questions. I think that's where we also, as, as progressives, need to bring the, the moral issues uh, more and more into it. Uh, I think our societies will, okay. will, will, have, will see a lot of disintegration and, and polarization and, uh, and, and, um, and divisions. We've run out of time. Can I, uh, in closing, thank uh, my colleagues for the organization of the event and colleagues around the school uh, for helping uh, with this uh, event as well. We had a discussion as to how we could thank our speaker as a distinguished alumnus of the LSE. What could we give a distinguished alumnus uh, such as George Papandreou? And we eventually decided that we should give him not this bag, but the contents of the bag. <laughs> and uh, being a, a distinguished alumnus, what would he wish to take away from the London School of Economics? And we came up with that. <laughs> so, can I thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Please thank you, George Papadou. Thank you very much.